Thank you, uh, Molly, and, and thanks to all of you uh, with ACE for this uh, tremendous honor. I know all of us uh, who serve in these roles do some at some personal sacrifice, but in addition to that, I think our families, uh, frankly, have much more sacrifice uh, than we do as individuals, and I'm pleased tonight to have my daughter Rebecca with us. My uh, wife, Barbara, of 45 years, could not be with us this evening because she has some uh, heart-related health challenges, but um, just so you won't think she's lost her sense of humor, she asked me to tell all of you this morning when I was getting ready that uh, these are the links that she has to go to to keep from having to sit through another one of my speeches. <laughs> so. It, uh, it's also tremendously humbling to have the opportunity to give an address named after Robert Atwell. Uh, all of you know, uh, many of you know Bob, who, as Molly suggested, served ACE for nearly two decades and a dozen years as a CEO, uh, true leader in our profession, and uh, delivering a, a lecture in his name is certainly a, a humbling experience. I do, uh, in getting ready for this, uh, presentation over the last week or two, I, I gave a lot of thought to the work I've done uh, over the past several decades, and it, it was clear to me that access and success really are the things I focused on most of my career. And I, I realized uh, not too long after I was a newly minted president in uh, the Central Valley of California and had given what I thought was really a pretty good uh, presentation on success and address, and right after it was over, a faculty member came up to me, uh, I will not forget his name, Frank Quintana, and Professor Quintana said, you know, Mr. President, all of that rhetoric about success and access really doesn't make any difference if the numbers don't change. And he was right. I began at that time to think a lot about accountability in higher education, and I, we ask ourselves the question often, why accountability? And I think obviously the most important reason for all of us is that the success of those individual students on our university and college campuses are the reason all of us get up and come to work every day. We want them to succeed and therefore their families to be better and ultimately our society to improve as a result of that. But I think there are compelling reasons otherwise for higher education and accountability. If you look at these uh, OECD rankings of the U.S. competitiveness in the global uh, economy, and you look at that uh, oldest segment of the workforce, that 55 to 64, and, and by the way, I see that number and realize that, that I and maybe many of you in the room are now must be in the irrelevant category of the workforce. But <laughs> for those uh, uh, of us, uh, though our workforce in that category, we're still third in the globe in terms of the percentage of that population that has higher education attainment. However, as you see, as our workforce gets younger and younger, they fall further and further behind. This study was originally done in 2010, and our uh, group of workers coming out of our colleges into uh, the economy was at that time uh, 12th in the nation, and subsequently we've dropped to 14th. And so we are fa falling further and further behind. And President Obama in the last couple of years, along with policy leaders across this country, have said we both need more people attending American higher education institutions, and they need to be succeeding in greater and greater numbers. And when you drill down into the census data, you see that 40% of Americans who are 16 to 24 years of age are not in any form of formal education. Those are coming out of high school into our colleges, 40% of them are not involved, and if you look at the, further at the statistics, 15% of that same demographic is what the Census Bureau calls disconnected. They're neither working nor in school. And so that is the potential of a generation of Americans disadvantaged if they don't get reconnected in our institutions. Now we've done better, if you go back to the 60s, uh, early 60s, the uh, National Center on Educational Statistics shows that about 26% of our population were attending higher education institutions. Fast forward to uh, 2012, and that number is in excess of 40%. And in fact, when you uh, look at the numbers, you see that uh, previously underserved uh, groups, African Americans have uh, doubled their participation rate in that time, and our Hispanic population has nearly tripled their participation in higher education. And yet, truthfully, it's not enough. The Georgetown Center on Workforce and uh, Education suggests to us that, there we go, that uh, about a quarter of the jobs back in the 70s 
uh, required education beyond a high school diploma, and that's about what we had enrolled in our colleges at that point. Fast forward to uh, the 90s, and you see it, it went past 50%, and now the center tells us that by 2020, 65% of the new jobs created in this country are going to require education beyond a high school diploma, and as we said a moment ago, only about 42% are currently enrolled in our institutions. And so we in California tend to be a bellwether state, and by the way, I know that sometimes that may be good and sometimes it's not so good, but the truth is, in California, we do have a huge stake in higher education. If you look, as Molly suggested, at our system, 113 colleges enrolling in excess of 2 million students. Roughly one out of every five uh, community college students in America is enrolled in one of these colleges. And when you add in the University of California and the California State University system, one out of every eight students in American public higher education is enrolled here in California. And so we really do have a vested interest in getting this right, not only for the state of California, but certainly for helping this country's competitiveness as well. And they, in doing that, we face two really daunting challenges. We've mentioned those. The first of them is increasing access. And to give you an idea how that's going, it's not been going well recently. This shows you that during the Great Recession, in 0809, our high water mark, we had nearly 2.7 million students in California's community colleges. You can see what happened to that going down to 1213 when we dipped below 2.1 million students. We've uh, had a denial of access to 600,000 Californians during that period of time, and it may have been actually higher than that because our enrollment was on the upswing when that happened. And so, when you look at the participation rate uh, back in 08, 09, about one out of every 11 adults 18 years and older were attending a California community college. That dipped down in uh, 11, 12 to 77 out of every 1,000, and by this current uh, past year, only one of every 14 adults were enrolled in our colleges. And again, if we're going to uh, establish California and this country competitively in this globe, we're going to have to increase those participation rates. The second is student success, and the news here is mixed as well. Again, if you look at our colleges with 2.1 million students enrolled, if you come to a California community college as a college student, you have a better than 70% chance of succeeding in a six-year period of time. We do track our students for a long number of years because the vast majority of them are with us part-time. They have jobs and families. But if they come college ready, they succeed in excess of 70% of the time. However, if they come in need of remediation, their success rate in that six-year period of time drops down to 40%. The blended rate is only about 47%. You may wonder why it only goes up a bit. It's because the next slide is perhaps the most troubling in the deck and that is that nearly three of every four students that come to our college are in need of remediation of either math or English or both. And so when we looked at student success and access, we realized several years ago that we were doing a lot of talking about it and not really taking a lot of action. And so we did suggest to ourselves that we really needed to be more accountable. And the impetus for that accountability was, as we've discussed a moment ago, first and foremost to improve the plight of our students, to help them get into our colleges in greater numbers and to help them succeed in greater numbers. We were also faced with a legislature that really wanted to do outcomes-based funding, performance-based funding. We believed this was a chemistry for failure. We thought if we funded only outcomes, we'd change the character of our colleges and, in essence, disadvantage the very students that needed us the most the educationally and economically disadvantaged. And so our student success initiative started in 2011, and the Board of Governors of the system approved the 22 recommendations in January of 2012, and part of those was based on accountability for the work that we were doing. And we also knew that if the state's finances came back and when they came back, that simply going to the legislature and saying to them, hey, give us more money to do the same thing we've been doing was probably not going to get us anywhere. And so we did embrace accountability. And what I'd like to do for a few minutes this evening is to talk with you a bit about that system as a means of underpinning accountability in higher education. When you look at the way we're working on this, we're tracking student cohorts over a six-year period of time. And so we take a snapshot of each of those cohorts each year. 
Now, when our students consume our education, they do most of that consumption in years one, two, and three. As you can see, after that, it, the consumption of the courses they take tends to drop off. However, the completions tend to lag behind that, as you would expect them to, and so the top line there shows the uh, transfers. Uh, the middle line are associate in arts and science degrees, and the bottom line are certificates, and you can see that consumption takes place uh, lagging behind. So here's what we do every year. We take a snapshot of each of those six cohorts. And so the one we just completed, we took a snapshot of the last year that we could impact the 9-10 cohort, and the first year we could impact the 14-15 cohort, and a snapshot of, of the other cohorts in between. And what we're trying to do is monitor rates, not volume. One of the criticisms that was leveled against us was when we talked about the fact that our, our certificates and our, our graduation rates were going up, Folks said, well, of course they're going up. Your enrollment's going up. They're going to go up by inertia. And so this system really takes a look at the rate of students that are succeeding in courses and graduating and transferring. We are going to talk about just a few of the metrics we use. There's about 20 of them all together, but I want to talk about uh, metrics in access and equity related to access, a word or two about a metric in success generally and then in equity uh, related to success because the Board of Governors and all of us believe that simply having all students do better is not enough. We have to close the attendance gaps and the performance gaps by race, ethnicity, age, and gender at the same time we're helping all boats rise. And then I want to say a word about return on investment, which uh, in a system that's funded by the state at $8 billion is something the legislature is obviously quite interested in. We decided pretty early that simply monitoring our progress wasn't going to get the job done. We really had to be brave enough to set goals and then monitor our progress against those goals. And so let me share just a couple of the access metrics first, uh, the overall metric and then one related to, uh, to uh, equity. The goal of the overall is to increase the participation rates of that 18 to 24 population that's been dropping off. And so you can see that it fell precipitously from 08, 09 until the bottom of that recession. And now, finally, we've been adding back courses and students have begun to return. And so in this case, we met that goal. Now, the board is likely to start using a numerical goal in the future, but until we got the inertia back into our enrollment, they were reluctant to set specific number goals. Now let's look at equity of participation, and again here, the goal is to ensure participation by race and ethnicity, age and gender that mirrors what the overall population suggests. We have two groups that were historically underrepresented, our African American students and our Latino students, Hispanic students, and as you can see here, we did not meet the goal for our African American students. They now have dropped below the percentage of African Americans in the state's population. Our Hispanic students have improved pretty dramatically over the last several years. That group has grown, and we did meet the goal of improving their participation rates. But obviously, our African American students' participation rate drop off is something we're going to have to spend some time on in the, in the not too distant future. Success and equity, let me talk for a moment about a success goal, and again, overall, and then I'll drill down into equity. Keep in mind, there's about a dozen of these all together. I'll just share one or two of them. All of this is driven by our accountability system, which is the Student Success Scorecard. You can go on the website of any one of our 113 colleges or the system office, and you'll see that blue box with those yellow letters. You click on that, and you can see how each one of the individual colleges is doing on all the key indicators of success, not only transfer and degree and certificate completion, but success in basic skills and English and math and English as a second language, uh, success in completing a CTE uh, degrees, uh, retention, all of the key indicators of success. I'd encourage you to go to that system and take a look at it. Uh, looking at uh, completion rates overall, the goal here was to improve those cohort completion rates by 2.5%. Now, to give you an idea of what that can mean, if we continue completion at the rate it is now, we expect over the next decade to have about 1,685,000 students complete either a degree, a certificate, or successfully transfer. A 2.5% increase in those cohorts would mean instead that we have about 227,000 more successful students if we're able to meet that goal. 
Now, just to give you an idea how things are going, again, we look at each one of those cohorts every year, and you'll see the top one, the 08, 09, and the different shades are the different years we've looked. And the goal, if we had increased the, the success of that cohort, the last year we had to influence them, by 2.5%, we would have hit a 4.95% in that year completion rate. We didn't hit that goal, as you can see. Nor did we hit the goal for the 9-10 cohort. However, for the 10-11 and the 11-12, the cohorts we have more time to impact, we actually did hit those goals. And obviously, when we look at the leading indicators, and I, I could go through all these and I won't, but basic skills in math and English, we now have a six-year track record of improved completion of those courses, and we believe that's going to help drive the overall completion numbers up in the future. Now, drilling down into to, uh, equity, because remember, simply having all students succeed at greater numbers is not enough. We want to make sure we don't leave any Californians behind. So again, the goal here is to have all of our subpopulations achieving at the same rate that all the students do. So if anybody's below 1.0, they're not performing at the same level as all the students. And you can see here that Pacific Islanders, African Americans, and Hispanic students were all performing below the students as a total population. And so the goal was to improve all of those. We did hit the goal for African American and for Latino students, but we did not for our Pacific Island students. You can see the numbers for Pacific Island students are a little bit more erratic, and that's because the number of that group of students is somewhat smaller. And so the final uh, set of metrics I want to mention are return on investment metrics, and there are a number of these. The state's favorite is what we call efficiency, and that's how much education we have to provide to get a successful completion. The Department of Finance loves that particular metric, and obviously the more efficient we become, the better they like it. But I want to uh, focus on a couple of ROIs that have to do with students and families. The first is a skills builder metric that we rolled out just last week. And the goal here was to try to quantify and document what it meant to take even one or two community college courses. So the definition of this skill builder metric was to take a look at uh, a group, a population that was adding skills for employment or career development. That was the reason they came to us. They did not come for the purpose of getting a certificate or a degree or transferring. In the most uh, cases, they were taking just one or two community college CTE courses, and the vast majority of these were older students who had a lot of experience in the workforce. What we found was 92,000 students in our system in that one cohort that fit that definition. The return on investment for those students was a 14% wage gain in one year or $4,300 a year and the benefit to the state of California was a half a billion dollars in added wages pumped into California's economy. Now those of us in American community colleges have been saying for years that traditional accountability systems that only measure degrees and certificates and transfer don't fit our mold because we do have some students that come to us to try to better themselves in their current jobs. For the first time we've been able to document that students that take even a class or two of career tech education get a return on investment that really justifies their uh, time and their money. And then finally, a salary surfer uh, uh, item that uh, takes a look uh, here at the, the uh, quantification of the improvement in salary from somebody who completes a degree or a certificate in the 172 most often enrolled programs in our colleges. And what we did here was to try to, we used UI wage data in this one and the last one and matched it up to Social Security numbers to try to find out what students were making two years before they completed a degree or certificate and two and five years after. So when you go online, you'll see that Salary Surfer logo, and obviously you can't read this here. I'll blow a couple of them up, but here's an example. One of our degree programs, cardiovascular technician program, on average students were making about $20,000 a year two years before they completed that program. Two years after the program, their wages had gone up to in excess of $61,000, and five years later they made in excess of $71,000. Now the return on investment of that program is pretty clear. I'd love to tell you they're all like that, but they're not. Here's an example of a dental lab uh, technician certificate program, a one-year program where a student was, on average was making about $20,000 a year before they completed that program and only a few hundred dollars more two years later and a few thousand dollars more five years later. 
Now, this tool is not designed to be the only reason students and families decide what to study. However, it is a way for students and their families to get a, an honest assessment of what the return on their time and their money is likely to be if they pick a given major. Students love this tool. They are online looking at it all the time, and again, it just enhances the transparency that we have in our system. And so embracing accountability has something that, uh, that we have uh, done, and we did it with a great deal of uh, fear and trepidation to begin with. We really did worry a lot that opening ourselves up to this level of transparency was going to result in an extreme amount of criticism. We knew that sharing some of these data were going to make a lot of people really uncomfortable, and we worried that uh, we'd get uh, an awful lot of backlash from it. We also worried that, as a result, the legislature would give us less money instead of more. We really did fear that they would think we weren't doing a good job and therefore didn't want to fund us. We also worried about pushback from the 113 colleges who might say, hey, we don't want this level of transparency out about how we're doing in graduation rates and transfer and completion and basic skills and other areas. And of course, we really worried about more micromanagement from state policymakers who would say to us, well, you're, you can't do it the way uh, you're doing it, so we'll tell you exactly how we want you uh, uh, to behave in the future. Instead, what we found was just the opposite. First, we found understanding and praise for the fact that we were being transparent. I can recall going in front of a Senate Ed Committee and sharing these data and worrying what reaction I would get. And instead of the uh, reaction we feared, in fact, they were uh, stunned by the challenge our faculty were trying to overcome with nearly three of every four of our students, not college students, when we got them. And they were very complimentary of the transparency and very supportive. Instead of getting our budgets cut, we got over the last two and a half years a billion dollar addition to our budget targeted at equity, at student success, and restoring access. We had a plan for improving things. The legislature and the governor rewarded us with that plan and continue today to fund that activity. We saw a cultural shift in our colleges. Yes, our colleges have always, as have all of yours, been about student success. But having these numbers and this level of transparency caused conversations to take place at the campus level that we could never have envisioned. And the improvements in the activities are apparent as a result. And finally, instead of more intervention, we saw the legislative staff and the legislature and the administration back off and say, if you're willing to be this honest and you're willing to invest in improving equity and access, we're going to be more patient with you. And so as a result of all of this, I've uh, summed up my five realities of uh, success, access, and accountability. And the first one of those is, it is real that we are going to face students that are less prepared than we wish they were. And by the way, it's not just America's community colleges that are facing less prepared students. Even those of you in research and highly selective institutions are facing similarly challenged students. We simply can't spend a lot of time blaming high schools or parents or even the students themselves. The fact is they're not as well prepared as we'd like for them to be. We have to deal with that. In our case, it means getting down into the high schools in the junior and senior year and trying to provide remedial instruction to move them out of that unprepared and prepared category and by doing so nearly double their chance of succeeding. Secondly, we know that uh, becoming more transparent is going to increase the number of people that want to help us. And I have uh, been amazed at the think tanks that have, because all of this data is available, and it's pretty available to all the researchers, so if they're researchers, they can get in and use that data, and they all have a vested interest, many of them, and so we do get a lot of bright, shiny objects that people think if we'll just do that, it will solve all our problems. It has been a real challenge for us to stay focused on what we know can improve success and access and not uh, be succumb to folks that want to help us uh, uh, do something differently. Third is, uh, I think we, we simply have to stop using the lack of public and private support as an excuse for not working to improve access and success. Yes, having more money makes this easier, but we started this planning and implementation at a period when we had no money. In fact, budgets were going in the wrong direction. We lost 20% of our funding over a four-year period of time while we were implementing many of these changes. 
It is a reality. Our budgets are going to go up and down. We have to stay true to improving success and access regardless. Fourth, we really should embrace accountability, but we shouldn't be fearful of pushing back against metrics we don't believe in. I don't believe then, and I still don't believe today, in performance-based funding. Many of the states in the country have gone to that. I think it has the uh, unintended consequence, ultimately, of forcing colleges not to serve the students that are educationally and economically disadvantaged. But you can't push back against that kind of what I believe to be wrong-headed accountability if you don't have an accountability system that you can turn to and say, we will monitor our progress and be honest. And finally, we simply can and should set goals for this system and measure our progress. Accountability in the last uh, many years in our system has really been something that we first feared and now have embraced. We really do believe a large part of the reason that we've seen five-year consecutive improvements in basic skills and math and English, upticks in English as a second language, and the beginnings of restoration of access, and that we are trying to begin to close those performance and attendance gaps by race and ethnicity, by age and gender, is aided by the fact that everybody knows every year we're going to lay these data out for everyone to see them. I really do believe that we're at a point, uh, all of us in higher education, where uh, we've all realized a long time ago, or we wouldn't have gotten into this work, that the anecdote for many of the challenges that face not only this country, but the globe, can be solved in our higher education institutions. We can help students attend college and succeed and therefore go out and become productive citizens, not only for themselves and their family, but for our states, our country, and for this country in general. I really do believe we're building America's future one successful student at a time. I'd encourage all of you to uh, take a look at these accountability systems. As uh, you heard Molly say, on April Fool's Day, I'm, uh, I'm hitting the exits. So after four and a half decades in this uh, work, I couldn't be more bullish on American higher education than I am today. It's been a pleasure to uh, have a few minutes with all of you this evening. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.